Welcome to today's talk by Natasha Noy on dataset search. Natasha Noy is a senior staff scientist at Google Research, where she works on making structured data accessible and useful. She leads the team building dataset search, a search engine for all datasets on the web. Prior to joining Google, Noy worked at Stanford Center for Biomedical Informatics Research, where she made major contributions in of ontology development and alignment and ontology engineering. Noy is a fellow of the, American, of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, and she served as the president of the Semantic Web Association from 2011 to 2017. So that's the official bio, so to speak. I wanted to add personal words. When I was a still undergrad student back in the late 90s and interested in ontology, engineering and RDF in the very, very, very days of the 2000s, there was not much literature to actually read from a side of the rather philosophical parts from, you know, fabulous um, Italian research labs in, in Nicola Garino. So my go-to address, so to speak, for more, what do I do with this? How does this all work? Was always Natasha Noy's work. And I still remember to this day, and just in a teleconference one week ago, I brought this up, your line versus line book and airy reification examples. So, you know, being a major contributor to ontology alignment and ontology development is one thing. Being one of the first contributors to all these domains and still being so relevant, and, you know, these papers being so relevant 20 years after, that's truly inspirational and impressive. So we are going to hear about Google dataset search from Natasha today. This is part of a joint speaker series of track A and track B of the NSF Convergence Accelerator Project, a program where we bring together or where we hope to bring to you some of the leading minds and practitioners on knowledge graphs, knowledge representation, knowledge engineering, fair data, and so on. This talk is being recorded, so and be mindful of this once you ask questions or type something into the chat. If there were any hiccups for some reason, we can also remove them later. And Natasha, I'm so excited to hear from you. The stage is all yours, so take it away. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for such generous introduction, Christoph. Um, so, and hello to all the friends that I see here joining. Um, I wish I could see you in person, but thank you so much for signing in. Uh, for those of you who have heard some me talk about data set search, some of this will sound familiar or you have heard about it. I apologize for that. Um, uh, Feel free to check your email during that portion of the talk, but let's begin. So, oh, and I want to leave, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I want to leave plenty of time for question, uh, questions and give us some chance to interact a little bit and chat uh, about this work and your thoughts on this types of ideas. So I want to talk today about our work on data, building data set search at Google and thinking of this as an um, open ecosystem for data set discovery. And I want to start to pause here on the subtitle and kind of focus on a couple of issues, a couple of specific things here. And one is uh, that I will emphasize during the talk. And one is the fact that they, uh, with thinking of this as an open ecosystem. So it's not just, you know, oh, we're sorry. building a product. Uh, we're building, uh, we're, we're building something uh, that just works for us. Uh, but we're thinking of this more in terms of the ecosystem and in terms of how can we actually think about data sharing in general and how can we improve sort of the way data sharing open, uh, happens in the ecosystem in general. Another thing I want to emphasize is, um, you know, Google is a search company and we think of ourselves very much as a search company. And so I'll go focus here and I will mention it several times is data set discovery. So for data set searches, in some sense, exactly what it sounds like, it's a search engine. Our goal is to help users find where the data sets are and then to take them to, uh, to the data set repositories or individual pages or a number of, uh, or whatever website where the data set is. So we we'll work in the context of the web, not surprisingly, because you know, if you ask yourself when you look for data, where do you usually look for it? It's obviously on the web. I think that's pretty much where we live these days. Unless, of course, you know exactly where the specific uh, data set that you're looking for is. And there's thousands of data repositories across the web. I'm sure we all know that, you know, there are 
uh, a lot of generic data repositories, repositories like Data Dryad or Pickshare. Uh, a lot of communities uh, of practice have their own data repositories. And in fact, for those of us who are part of those community of practice, a specific community of practice, let's say, you know, some subset of life sciences or some sort of climate scientists, we don't really need a search engine like dataset search to find the data set. Um, but then the moment we step out of our own community of practice, that's where, you know, we used to sometimes run into friends and colleagues at a conference and ask them where data sets of a particular type are. We don't do that very much anymore. And many of us never really had the chance to run into colleagues to ask what data sets are. So uh, we view sort of the problem that we're trying to sell, solve is this problem of a lot of silos of data sets where within, again, each closed knit community, we know exactly where to look for data. But once we do something interdisciplinary or if we're new to the field, we don't necessarily know where the data is. And so that's essentially the main mission for data set search. Uh, I'm sure pretty much everybody on this call is familiar with Google Scholar. You know, you go to Google Scholar to search for publications and then Scholar takes you to um, Elsevier or Archive or whatever the um, specific publisher for that those papers, data set search, exactly the same mode. You come to data set search to look for data and then we um, take you to where the data is. Um, so a couple of key things here um, that I want to emphasize, and I'll talk about the sort of technology behind all of this in a minute. Uh, we search over metadata and not, not over data. Um, so, which basically means two things. On the one hand, metadata is absolutely critical. And again, we'll talk about it in a minute a little more. Um, it's also basically data set search will always be only as good as the metadata that uh, data set providers provide. And that's why sort of I started by talk, talking about ecosystem. I don't think sort of, I think uh, tools like that feed into the ecosystem and makes, for example, the, the need for data set metadata a little more pertinent. At the same time, they also will also rely on the ecosystem because without uh, data providers describing um, describing metadata in say an open standard uh, tools like that one cannot build tool like, tools like that and as I mentioned our key goal is discovery so our key goal is to take the users to where the data is so those big blue buttons there are basically here's where the data is again very similar to the paradigm that you're all familiar with Google Scholar so. As we're trying, so if we think, you think a data set search is essentially a search engine over metadata um, describing data sets, um, what are the two key questions that we need to answer from the techno technical point of view? So the first question is, as we crawl the web and as we look at all the pages on the web, what are the, what are the pages that actually describe data sets? Right? What are the pages that should sort of, would be reasonable destinations for someone looking for data set or a specific topic. And once we uh, identify that this page is about a data set, what then the question is, what is the sort of, what is the title, the description of the data set? Do we have information about the license? Do we have information about where to download data set and so on? And so these are two questions and you can come up and we have actually explored ideas of trying to, you know, define this automatically, but ultimately we decided that the main, our main approach is actually going to be the same approach that um, a lot of search engines use for a lot of other vertical searches as well. And that's the relying on schema.org and essentially structured data markup um, that um, the data providers can put on, the, on their own sites. And if this were live, uh, talk, I would ask how many of you have heard about schema.org to get a sense of the room. My sense is most of you have heard about it, but for the, if in case you haven't, I, like I'll introduce you, I introduce it for one minute, uh, bear with me, please. Uh, so it is essential, it's a markup, it's, it's something you data providers embed in their HTML to describe what's on the page. It's not specific to data sets. 
Um, it's a standard that was initially founded by uh, search engines about 10 years ago. It's very widely used on the web. Um, and it's basically, uh, it's, it's, it's both the syntax, uh, there's several different syntaxes for it to embed it in HTML. And it's more important, it's a vocabulary to say, this page is about data set. This page is about a recipe. This here is uh, for recipes, here's what the recipe is about. Here are the ingredients. Uh, here is the steps, for example. Um, so the two key things is uh, that it is embedded in HTML and so regular web crawler can pick it up. Um, it's also non-proprietary. Uh, there is a community organization around it uh, to extend it. It's also extensible. Um, and it's mostly driven uh, by features in products and various, by it's mostly sort of what's, um, the adoption itself is driven by features and products. And I'll mention this actually. It's, so for example, schema.org dataset actually existed as a type for years before we started dataset search, but essentially there were only a few sites that had it once dataset search came along. So basically once it became use, used, not so much useful, but used somewhere, the adoption actually has grown up exponentially. So, a lot of products at Google and at other companies, I use Google examples here, rely on schema.org. So, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, at least in the United States, everybody was breaking, baking sourdough bread. So I use that as an example. Uh, so if you look for recipes, this kind of structured format, structured responses that you get, like how long it takes, um, where it comes from, and sort of some and in fact, if you click like the steps, they come from schema.org descriptions on the provider's site. Uh, same if you look for jobs, uh, the interface that you see, kind of the structured search that you see that also comes from schema.org on the provider's site. So it, I'll actually skip this. So it was only natural that we did, used exactly the same thing. What you see in data set search also comes from schema.org on the provider's site. So to sum up, conceptually what our work is and then I'll go sort of talk a little bit about the technical details and then some of the recent statistics on over this is basically what we're trying to build is a vertical search engine. It's a search engine that specifically relies on metadata and a search engine over metadata. Um, and it's a search engine over metadata that data providers uh, put on their pages. So it's basically only as good or as bad. Um, as the metadata that the providers provide. So a little bit of what we actually do once we get this uh, metadata and sort of some, a little bit of the, uh, what's under the hood. Uh, and we published it in a couple of papers so you can find a lot more details there. But basically the web crawler goes out. Um, there are now data sets described in schema.org on thousands of domains on millions of pages. So it's the standard Google crawl. We don't have any additional crawl, but because schema.org is so much ingrained in law and structured data and cement, the semantic markup is so ingrained, ingrained in a lot of different, in the way kind of search engines understand the web, it comes in, it's sort of, it's part of the crawl that it actually, in addition to parsing HTML, it also creates essentially a, a set of triples from each page uh, that describe, um, the semantics of the page. And so what we do is take the that subset of the pages that actually say, I have a data set on my site. I have a schema.org data set uh, markup on the page. And then we try to essentially build something useful from it at kind of magic dust. It. And so a few things that we do is right in the middle there is we do a lot of cleaning. So one of the things that we have discovered probably everybody else realized that before I sort of like it occurred to me as well, is that if you're operating at the web space, at the sort of web scale, if there is something that can go wrong or something that can be misinterpreted or something that can go wrong, it absolutely will. Um, so every single field, every single, you know, way, the amount of ways that people represent dates or people describe download formats or anything else, there are standards. And you know, if you look, go on schema.org web page, it tells you exactly how to describe a date. Obviously that's not exactly how people do that. So we do a lot of kind of cleaning, normalizing, 
and trying to make the best of the metadata that we actually get from those pages. Um, we also reconcile to the knowledge graph. So Google has a knowledge graph. Again, this is the OKN network. I, I don't think I need to talk a lot about what that is. But if you think about data set metadata, there's several components of that metadata that semantically actually correspond to objects in the knowledge graph. This would be things like organizations for providers, like who provided the data set, uh, the funders of the data sets. They're all organizations present in the knowledge graph. Uh, different types of licenses, uh, locations for geospatial data sets. All of that is present in the knowledge graph and schema.org actually gives us semantic types for different fields, right? So we know, for example, that um, spatial coverage is a location or we know that provider is an organization. So this enables this kind of um, reconciliation. So we do a lot of reconciliation with the knowledge graph, uh, which in turn gives us all this additional information on, you know, if the data set was funded by NSF, well, we know all the labels for NSF, we know the website for NSF from the knowledge graph. We can actually answer queries in multiple languages because there are labels in multiple languages. And so it gives us all this additional information. Oh, you know, uh, there was a particular department of NSF that, uh, that was specified as the funder. We can actually generalize that to the National Science Foundation, for instance. So that's what Knowledge Graph, graph gives us. And we can discuss more later in the questions if uh, people in the call are interested. Uh, well, also, because we're operating very much, a, lot, a large chunk of data sets that we have are scientific data sets and data sets that are um, cited in papers. And we actually, on the one hand, and on the other hand, we actually want to encourage this type of citation We'll also look for mentions of the data sets in Google Scholar uh, so that we can say in the results, this data set is um, cited in this many pa pages. Oh, I'm sorry, this many papers. Um, I'll return to this in a little while when we talk about DOIs, but we do try to um, reconcile with Google Scholar. Um, so a few more details, um, actually I already, uh, I'll mention this in a little, so I wanted to basically go deep, a little bit deeper in a couple of those things that we do. So I've mentioned we do a lot of cleaning. A um, couple of other things in addition to sort of specific data fields like dates and download formats. Um, a couple of other things that we do that I think worth calling out, which we can do in part because the corpus essentially is a view of the whole web. And there, um, and we, what we try to do, so one of the things that's pretty common in data sets, uh, perhaps less common in some other types of verticals, is a good valuable data set is often represented, present in more than one data set repository. And that's actually a very good signal for us. So they're replicas across repositories. And ideally, of course, uh, schema.org provides opportunity, a way for you to say, you know, this data set is the same as this other data set that we aggregated it from. Tiny percentage of data, of data set providers actually use same as links for that. So we actually do quite a bit of work in trying to cluster together this um, different um, replicas of the same data set in different repositories and to try and infer the provenance information as much as we can so that when we show to the results to the user saying, here's the data set, it's present and you can find it in these five repositories. It's particularly common for government data sets, but we try to sort of show you the, what we think is the primary repository if, if we actually have that information as the first result. So we try to think a little bit about provenance. We know that it's extremely important for the data providers themselves. And so that's why we actually spent quite a bit of time on that. Um, Oops, sorry. Actually, that's uh, that's the replicas part. I, I apologize, I didn't skip the slide. Um, and so to do that, so basically, in order to identify these different replicas in different um, uh, in different repositories, we again similar or same as what big great way to do this. I believe a single digit percentages of the replicas actually use that. I think I believe it's few, less than 
So we use, again, a number of heuristics here where we try to infer these kinds of kind of clusters of replicas. What are the things that we do? Uh, the, what, what are the other things that we do here? Well, so as I mentioned, you know, I'm uh, so this kind of data flow diagram, you know, I'm a computer scientist, I should have a diagram like that somewhere in my talk. Um, so if we kind of take end to end view of how data set search works, as I've already mentioned, there is a web crawl that goes out, creates that gives us the metadata in terms of triples. We do all this cleaning reconciliation that I have talked about. And then we essentially send it to the index. Um, that's luckily, you know, so because, because go sort of we can there we can rely on a lot of Google infrastructure for indexing uh, and searching the results. And essentially then, you know, the users um, search the results that goes back to the index and comes back as ranked results. Um, so I want to pause a little bit and talk a little bit more about ranking here. And one of the things where we're lucky, I guess, uh, is that compared to a lot of um, data set repositories and data catalogs that need to figure out how to write data sets, which are on internal. So we chatted in the beginning with Valentina, for example, when there are internal data catalogs. Um, uh, this is the difference here is we actually, these data sets come from the web. So we actually have also the web signal for every single page that we got the metadata from. And it's not perfect. Obviously, and there's a lot of research uh, that shows that data set ranking is different from web ranking. But in some sense, that was one of our biggest surprises in the beginning that just relying on the web signal and then a little bit about metadata quality and a little bit about scholar citations um, actually gave us a pretty decent ranking for data sets. Uh, we have improved it since then based on sort of traditional, you know, web ranking types of approaches. Um, but, but actually the web signal here was one of the most valuable signals for ranking. But again, this is something, that's one of those things that will not translate very well for anything that's on say a, um, enterprise data catalog exactly because that web signal isn't present. All right, so what I would like to spend the next few minutes on, again, I'm happy to, so I'm happy to answer any more questions about how things actually work, but I also want to give you a sense of what we actually found in terms of understanding the ecosystem and understanding the, um, what data sets on the web actually look like. And I'll give you some numbers, some statistics over the catalog, but I want to, uh, mentioned this major caveat that we think of this as a snapshot of data sets on the web. However, these are only the data sets on the web that have schema.org and DCAD. Actually, I haven't mentioned DCAD, but we also do understand DCAD, which is a W3C standard for describing metadata for data sets. So that have schema.org or DCAD markup. So we don't actually, we're trying to figure it out now and we're trying to do some research now to understand what fraction of all the data sets on the web this actually covers. But let's assume that this is, while this is a fraction of data sets on the web, it's a somewhat representative fraction. But again, this is a main caveat here. So what we have, we published this in ISWC last year based on uh, the state of our corpus, which had 31 million data sets at the time from 4,600 domains. Uh, internet domains. Um, we're actually, I checked last night for this talk, we're now actually at 42 million. So we have grown quite a bit and from uh, 8,000 domains. So, which actually makes sense that the number of data sets, uh, the number of domains grows faster than the number of data sets because a lot of domains that have millions of data sets or hundreds of thousands like Fixture, like data site, we have already included. They already had schema.org uh, markup. So what actually, uh, I'm very excited to see a lot of smaller domains, perhaps with just a few super valuable data sets come online uh, in this way. But the analysis that I show is based on this 31 million data sets. Uh, so this is the growth uh, through that time from that paper. Uh, you can see that in the, uh, from the time we had, uh, so I mentioned earlier that the adoption of standards like schema.org 
is essentially driven by its use in products. And you can see that, you know, from the um, time that we, so, so when we actually started working on data set search and published different blog posts saying, you know, schema.org data set seems like a useful, is a, exactly the mechanism to describe semantics of your page if it has a data set on it. At the time, there were about half a million data sets uh, that were described that way. So by the time we had our beta launch, there were about 10 million data sets, 31 million a year ago, 42 million now. Um, if we plot how many data sets are in each specific domain, it's very much a power law, not surprising. So at the time that we did the study, 10 domains accounted for 65% of the data sets. Um, I, th I, I think if we did this now, it will be a little bit different because as I mentioned, the number of domains has actually almost doubled, whereas the number of data sets has not, which, which again, to me, is the interesting part because the, the heavy hitters, the large repositories, people mostly know about. And I see a big value of a search engine like data set search in bringing the long tail in and allowing people to get to those long tail data sets. Um, and one thing that really surprised us um, is the incredible churn of the data sets. So here's just one comparison. So we looked, we had in June of 2019, we had 14 million data sets. Uh, in March of 2020, when we were doing the study, we had 28 million data sets. But only about 9 million of those were actually present in both. So, which means, <clears throat> You know, 5 million data sets from June 20, or at least data set URLs from June 29, were no longer there um, less than a year later. And that's what we have observed, interestingly, for internal catalogs as well, when we did this research before on internal data. And so, the, this incredible, so, and, and I think this can be attributed to, to a couple of things. And some are, you know, just things kind of come and go online, a lot of large repositories. Um, change their, their kind of URL schemas, change how they, because this is based on URLs, right? So URLs change, but generally I have to say, as we look at this, like oh, some non-trivial number of URLs, probably two, three percent, one to two percent of the corpus changes almost every day, comes and goes online, which will make the discussion that we'll have in a couple of minutes about persistent identifiers for data sets all the more important. And I want you to refer back to this slide when we talk about that. So we looked at, uh, so one of the, part of the um, metadata description of a data set is whether the data, uh, where to download the data set and what is the type of data set. So about 66% um, of data sets, uh, data set descriptions actually specify the format for the data, and then we try to aggregate it a little bit to have more kind of semantic labels here. So, and what we've learned is 33% uh, are tabular data, perhaps not very surprising. The next one is structured data, which would be XML and RDF. Um, archives like zip files, um, and then images and text and geospatial data. Um, Note that 10% document in there, these are mostly PDF and doc files, which are described as data sets, uh, which I think has actually, we've seen less of it these days, but uh, still PDF does seem to be an unreasonably large portion of data sets. Um, I remember a few years ago, someone did a study at data.gov, for example, that I think found that a third of data sets are in PDF format. And I think that's, that's not great, uh, to say the least. Um, also, okay, so uh, we also looked at the topic. So we tried to actually figure out the topic or the discipline that the data set covers. Um, but we didn't really rely on the keywords very much on the uh, metadata here because that's turned out to be extremely unreliable. Um, and so we basically just built a simple classifier uh, to, to figure out where the data sets come from. Uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest um, disciplines here are social science and geosciences with 
and of biology and life sciences being th close third. One interesting thing, sort of one interesting observation about geosciences and um, social sciences is that these, these were the two domains, two disciplines that we focused on before we launched uh, with the beta, because you know we had this chicken neck problem. In order to have a product that would be at least semi-useful, we had to have some number of data sets there already. On the other hand, people were not really putting uh, the markup on their pages before there was any product using it. And so we focused on these two verticals, geoscience and social science, and tried to reach out to kind of the main repositories in those domains um, so that at least we have uh, something to bootstrap with. And it's actually interesting that almost two years later, these are still sort of, this is the cumulative advantage idea, right? These are still the domains that are by far, they have grown quite a bit from that launch time, but you know, the idea that sort of we bootstrap from something and then, you know, in geosciences, okay, so you some of the bigger repositories have put schema.org um, on their site. So the smaller repositories came along and there's this kind of a little bit of a social phenomena here and they sort of use the modern word, the influencer uh, phenomena here where kind of the, once you have some influencers in a specific domain, things actually come along much faster. Uh, so finally, the last thing, well, one or two more things I want to talk about, but uh, when I talked about churn, I mentioned that, uh, you know, URLs come and go, URLs are really not a good way, and titles as well, uh, way to cite data sets. And, you know, for publications, we're pretty used to seeing digital object identifiers uh, or similar identifiers where, the specific scheme is not super important. What's important that they're persistent and dereferenceable, right? So it's it doesn't, I can, if I move my data set from one URL to another, I can still use the same DOI. We found that only 10% of data sets are actually citable by DOIs, which I think is pretty low, but I hope that will grow. So that's one of the things kind of in terms of best practices that would really be nice to see change. Another thing we talk a lot about open data and open data sets. And I want to mention that for data set search, you know, we don't actually require the data set itself to be open. The metadata must be open, but not the data itself. Uh, just kind of like the same with scholar, right? You might find a paper there, but then it's between you and the publisher where you can actually see the paper. What we do encourage and what I hope to see a lot more of is to have a specific license on the data, even if it's not open, or even if it's open, you, I'm sure many of you are aware that not having any license on the data is actually worse than having the most restrictive license, because then you're not actually saying how you can uh, use that data. Um, so about, we found, which was actually not as low as I expected it to be, that about a third of data sets now specify licenses. What's really interesting of the ones that do specify a license, the vast majority of them are, are open licenses and that are usually free for commercial and non-commercial use. Only 10% are not available for free. Um, so, we, which is actually very interesting kind of um, observation about the ecosystem. So basically when you do specify a license, most specify some freely available license. But from those two things and sort of a few of the things that I mentioned, um, kind of in conclusion, I want to talk a little bit about kind of best practices and kind of where to go from there. I think we all have a reasonably conditioned, sometimes by our publishers, sometimes by our funders, that we do need to publish data. But just kind of dumping data on the web somewhere or even in a repository itself is probably not enough anymore when we're thinking about the open ecosystem. There are a lot of best practices that kind of many of us are thinking about and that kind of make the data actually much more discoverable and much more useful when we think in the context of fair data. You know, putting uh, the, uh, those data sets in repositories with long-term storage that are not sort of that actually are crawlable by search engines so that they can be discovered by others. I talked about persistent identifiers, having structured metadata that reflects the semantics of what's in the data set in the format that's web friendly, that's compliant with some standards, which ideally has provenance information. 
having clear license descriptions. So all of this, the technical foundation is already there. All of this, you know, we have tons of ways to do this. I think it's becoming more it was actually a social challenge here, right? And kind of thinking a lot, and I think I know NSF is thinking a lot about it as well, is what are the incentives to publish? And, you know, it's probably the usual stick and carrot kind of approach. Um, <clears throat> what would it mean in general to share data in a way that's useful? Um, and again, the role of publishers and funding agencies is very, is very important here. Um, of course, you know, many of us on the call are computer scientists, so there are a lot of actually interesting computer science ch uh, challenges here. I've mentioned that the web ranking is um, adequate, but it's obviously not perfect. So what does what what does data set ranking actually mean? How do we determine data provenance? How can we improve the quality of metadata? Um, and um, in addition to what we get from schema.org, how do we find what data sets are similar? How basically we can make this more of an exploration uh, interface or sort of exploration experience for the users who don't necessarily, may not necessarily be looking for a specific data set, but trying to explore what data is available. Finally, I like this quote and I want to tell you a story that kind of indicates that this is actually not a new problem. We tend to think of data sharing and you know, publishing our data with our publications as fairly 21st century problem. But um, I was working on some data sharing paper with a physicist, um, and of course, he immediately went to look for quotes from Newton and actually found one. So there was um, Isaac Newton, so John, John Flamsteed was a royal astronomer at the time, and he published a paper with observations uh, of the moon, I know, moments, I believe. And Newton was actually very exasperated because he wanted the data and that uh, they, there were letters going back and forth. You can find those letters online between Flamsteed and Newton. Um, the, it all came almost to physical blows when the two men actually met. And this quote, I think, is kind of a great data sharing quote from Newton that says that these and all your communications will be useless to me unless you can propose some practicable way or other of supplying me with observations. I want not your calculations, but your observations only. And I think if this isn't a description of fair data, or at least some part of fair data, I don't, you know, you'd be the judge. I'll actually skip this because I want to leave time for questions. Um, but I, so, and I want to bring this back to the fair data, which I think a lot, most people on this call are familiar with and kind of anchor what I've been talking about essentially was just the part about findable data. And I think that's the first part of this uh, of this acronym. I'm not suggesting we solved it, but I think that's where we have focused on. Um, and there's obviously a lot more work to do in all the other parts, as well as on making data findable. I talked about technical challenges. Um, so circling back to what I started with, I think all of this works only in an open ecosystem where providers, consumers, developers, kind of feed off each other, uh, you know, it includes providers actually thinking about publishing data, data and metadata, thinking about those best practices I talked about. Consumers actually not only using the data, but citing the data and being able to cite the data. That's where, again, things like DOIs and sufficient metadata come in. Think about remembering to cite data as essentially first class objects in our publications. And of course, building tools that make all of that easier. And with that, I would like to thank the whole data set search team that makes this work possible and super fun. Here is the link to the to data set search itself. Here's my email if you have questions, but I'm I'm looking forward to the discussion now. I specifically left plenty of time for that. Well, that was a fabulous talk. Everybody is, you know, jumping up and down and clapping their hands. You just don't see them or hear them because we are all on mute. Um, but Natasha, I have never seen the chat so active. I, you know, I stopped reading at some stage. There are tons of interesting remarks and comments and maybe, you know, 
you can take brief peeks in between, but now let's open this up to questions that you can either type in the chat or raise your hand. And I see Gustavo already did so. So Gustavo, why don't you go first? Oh, now the hand is down. Are you going to say something or did you change your mind? I would go with say next. Suji, you could unmute yourself now and ask a question. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much, Natasha, for the great talk. Um, I have a question uh, from the side of the data provider. What can I do to um, improve accessibility of my data set? Is it only that I uh, just provide the metadata of schema.org or somehow um, I can also improve my ranking? What would you penalize? What would you prefer with the ranking? So we don't penalize or prefer in ranking. So the schema, having schema.org on your site makes it discoverable and, and allows us and anybody else to understand what's in that page. And that's kind of the key there. If you don't, if you don't have schema.org data set on your page, it's not discoverable basically. Another thing that's super useful and that's generally, it's not just for data sets uh, is to have a sitemap. Uh, just makes it a little easy to discover. Make sure that it's available to the crawl because sometimes, you know, pages are not, so pages are not crawlable, they're behind drops, <laughs> whatever. So sitemaps are super useful, particularly for data repositories, because oftentimes there is not a natural kind of crawling progression to every page. So if you have a data repository, having a sitemap that just lists all the pages is useful. Um, I think those are the two major things. Natasha, I have a question, Ravi Sharma. Mm -hmm. uh, when are we, uh, well, there is one way you have found or the community has found of creating knowledge graphs, which is a little higher level construct than basic data. When mm -hmm. are we going to move on from data that is very elemental data to information, which is of value? Uh, I hope there, and actually I see a lot of people on this call for working on making that happen. I don't think it's an either or necessarily. I think you need both data and knowledge, uh, you know, because you essentially, you know, you, you have the data is kind of the basic assembly language. And I agree with you that, you know, for a lot of applications, we actually need the more abstract notions on the aggregation of this data. Uh, but I don't believe it's either or necessarily. And I, and the more general question of when will we move from one to the other, I think, like I said, I see a lot of friends and colleagues on this call who are also trying to make that happen in different forms. Uh, uh, about the call for notebooks, uh, one of the- uh, The old the notion of information uh, architecture. I, I think there's two people talking, which makes it- Just fix that. I will, I will mute now, uh, except the last question. The information architecture is kind of lost between knowledge representation and data architecture. Uh, I, I think it depends on both on the knowledge representation and, but I mean, I, I agree with you. There's a lot more that we can do in Again, using both data and knowledge graphs and all those structures as a substrate for uh, more intelligent kind of information discovery and information aggregation. And I will apologize if I butcher your names. Maybe Natasha also wants to pick people individually, but as I, long I, as I, no, I, I can't see, I can't multitask. So I think- Christa, No, I'm, I I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to multitask for you. I just didn't want to, you know, to steal, so to speak, the, the moderation from you. So this would be either, my next pick would be either Brigitte Matia or Brigitte, depending on where you are hailing from. Oh, I'm from Germany. Uh, so, so Brigitte, okay. Yeah, so how many people are currently using Google Dataset Search and how do they find it? Because it's not part of the SERP as far as I'm, I've seen it. So I do not, I can't actually, I'm not sure I even remember the latest numbers on how people are using. I do, I actually, 
you do hit the nail on the head a little bit. Uh, just a lot of people just don't know this exists. We're still work we're working on various ways of integrating it and something like search. You know, when you find when you look for data sets, we give you uh, we give you a preview of here are the data data set results. So mostly the way uh, to answer your kind of second question, the way people find it is word of mouth, I guess, um, and sort of the way it it doesn't actually it's not. Yeah, it's basically a word of mouth um, right now. But we are working and hoping to be able to integrate it with main search in the way, in the same way other verticals are integrated, like jobs and recipes, where if you search for, if we think you're searching for data with, and we have results in our corpus, we can show you the preview and take it to data search. So okay, just and, and for the first question, do you have like maybe an estimate or something like that? Not off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Just to make sure we are not overlooking the chat, there's a great question from, from Phil Murphy. They're asking whether there's any ideas also to use Google dataset search on Google Sheets. We have talked to the Google Sheets team a little bit about that. Um, so I think the most, uh, you can kind of see it both ways, right? You can see, you find a data set that's a tabular data set and since to allow you to, uh, you know, in basically download it to bring it to sheets. Although we're trying to make sure that we don't bypass the data providers at the same time. And then you can also see the other way in sheets or, you know, you're looking for, you're trying to fill out some data and you go to data set search to find the data. So yes, we're bouncing around the ideas. I don't think it's super close on the horizon, to be honest. Um, but there are definitely interesting ways to integrate. Jeff Herfin, would you like to go next? There's something wrong with the sound, Jeff. Yeah. Jeff, maybe you can type in your question and then I can read it out loud and maybe in between we can hear from um, Alex Vargas. That will be the next person on my list here. Hi, uh, thank you, Natasha. I'm Alex Vargas. I'm a PhD student at the University of Texas El Paso. And I have a question. You have a slide where uh, you have some research questions about useful way uh, having uh, metadata in a, that is useful way, but also on the technical side, you have uh, provenance. So I was wondering, um, what have you found about uh, finding data sets uh, with metadata attributes beyond uh, the format? And where does the data belong to? Uh, I don't know, like um, talking about provenance, how the data was generated and processed? So, <sighs> Yeah, prominence is a very kind of interesting and tricky issue for us. So um, there's there are very few very basic properties in schema.org that address provenance, um, which you would think is you know to the detriment of schema.org. On the other, you know, there's like same as based on um, just kind of one or two others. It's not super expressive. On the other hand, we found that even that is not used very much. Um, so it's uh, prominence is, and a couple of other things is one of those parts of the metadata where, you know, the ontologist in me and the knowledge representation person in me really wants to like write all the, you know, we, we should use the pro ontology or some ontology to describe this. On the other hand, the pragmatic in me who has seen that people can't even put dates correctly into their schema.org properties thinks that, well, maybe the simplest possible way is fine, and then we can try and use heuristics or what we know about the various sites to infer the additional provenance information. So I, I think very, I mean, again, sort of the ontology may would love to say, you know, this data set really aggregates this, and hopefully we'll get to some of that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a hopefully virtuous circle here, right? But we're starting with the very basic, you know, can we figure out that this is the same as that one? Oh, we can rely on DOI when it exists, but it doesn't always exist. Um, 
more expressive uh, forms of providence for the moment don't seem to be super reliable signals on the web scale. Again, we have to do everything, like whatever we do has to apply to everything on the web. And that's what makes it harder, but also more exciting. Thank so you. So by now, by now, Jeff was able to, ta to type his question and he's asking or commenting on the fact that various research groups are working on machine learning for data set search, metadata augmentation and so on, and whether Google data set search is using any of these techniques or plans to do so in the future. Uh, we use a little bit of machine learning techniques for, for the augmentation and we are pretty well aware of what other research groups are doing and actually beginning to look into what those groups are doing too. I think we have done kind of the basics. Um, I mean, we are part of Google research, so we're actually, it, uh, we can experiment with things. And yes, I know there's a lot of, I know there's work from Jeff's group, but there is work from NYU. There are a, 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 a number of groups that are working on this. And yes, absolutely. There's, uh, there's a lot to be done in making and augmenting metadata and making it more useful, even, even in just the context of discovery. Right, and uh, there's a lot more we can do with new, with more sort of machine learning and knowledge representation. There. Before I move from the the chat back to to people asking their questions in person, there's one more question that may be related, namely about the relation between Google Maps, so to speak, and Google Dataset Search. Are there any relations between them, either showing search results for data sets on a map, depending on where they are, or something like this? Well, the other way around. So if you if you have a geospatial data set and as part of your spatial coverage, you specify the coordinates that that data set covers, let's say you have temperature for a particular region, we will show you the map. We use actually the same maps API that external users use uh, and we show you the map. Um, it's not clear to me that it makes sense on the other end, given that the majority of maps users uh, really just care about getting from A to B. So uh, Frank, Michael, and I'm, I apologize again if I'm butchering your name, you would be next. No problem. Uh, thank you. Hi, Natasha. Thanks for the talk. Always great to hear from news from your side. I was wondering, maybe this is something you mentioned during the talk, I'm not sure. Uh, some time ago, I read that uh, Google Dataset Search was considering exploiting other vocabularies than just schema dialogue. So there was DCAT, but maybe others. I was willing to know what is the status about that? And in particular, not only DCAT, but maybe others that give you hint insights in how you can consume the data. Like if you have a Sparkle service description, would you uh, yield that? Would you harvest that? And how could Google data set should Search give us insights about how we can really consume the data. What's or uh, what are the APIs and everything? Uh, so, so what what were the ones that you had in mind? So, Sparkle endpoints. What what, what uh, else? Sparkle the... SD service description is part of Sparkle, so it's a way to, of describing your endpoint and the uh, the formats. It supports the version of Sparkle, but maybe there there could be some other description of the API. Uh, I don't know, like. Uh, open API description or stuff like that. Right. So for DCAT, we actually use DCAT. We try to emphasize schema.org just because there's so much infrastructure and for us to use schema.org, but we actually do understand DCAT. Um, uh, for the other, for the, so for the API is more general, not just Sparkle. That's something that we grapple with quite often because just outside even of the semantic web, you know, you look at sites like NASA and NOAA and US Census, this huge super diverse repositories and the access to them is through APIs. Um, and like I said, we're grappling with this. I'm not sure there's a single standard that we can rely on for those APIs. And again, the semantic web person wearing my semantic web hat, of course, I want everything to be sparkle, but it's not the world. Um, so, um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer, unfortunately, except that API data sets that are accessed through API in general is something I don't think we have a good handle on, and I'd love to have a better handle on that. Thank you so much, Natasha. Unfortunately, Zoom reshuffles the, the people who raised their hand from time to time, but I believe that Raymond had 
his hand up all the time and also typed something to the chat. So Raymond, maybe you want to go next. Thank you. Um, my question is that uh, a number of communities have explored um, the idea of of you know developing their own domain specific search engine or tool or index, and that um, uh, and and one of the motivators would be to um, leverage domain specific metadata, and um, and on this concept of kind of having an open uh, open system, an open framework here. Have you thought about um, ways in which uh, multiple schemas or formats could be embedded into these pages uh, in a in a kind of an open way and in a way that wouldn't break the Google uh, indexing, but could uh, open the door for um, people sharing their metadata in other schemas or formats? That's a great question. And I think that's actually already happening. You can add other vocabularies uh, in there. And uh, I know bioschemas.org. I, I don't know if Carol is still on the call, but <clears throat> there are extens ex vocabularies that extend schema.org that you can, uh, excuse me, <laughs> that you can use that um, extend it, it won't break anything. I think more interesting part to this is can we use any of that, right? Other community standards that we can use to augment metadata. And for the moment, it would have stayed pretty generic because you saw sort of the spread of the different disciplines that we need to cover and that we cover. But I think I would, we still, again, that's another thing we're trying to grapple with is can we, include some of those, like something like bioschemas, for example, as an additional metadata. But adding that, so if communities have their own metadata and metadata standards won't break anything, even if it's an extension of schema.org, we'll might bypass it, but it's not like that part of the, that set of triples, but it won't break anything. Okay, so you're, you're not speaking strictly about extensions to schema.org, but like suppose somebody wanted to embed FDGC metadata in there that would be that would be fine yeah absolutely that's great i mean Not it should sure. still uh, a schema should, uh, like for the basics should still be there but yes additional right. things additional things sure. absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. okay Natasha, there are still many, many raised hands and questions coming on to the chat, you know, every few seconds and we have to close. But there's one last question, which I hope you will give us a little bit ahead. Namely, somebody is asking, what about authority, which I think is a great question. They observe that their data set, where they are the authoritative source, so to speak, is duplicated by different authors and then published there as origin while their own data appears under the other publishers category. Do you have your thoughts about how to deal with authority and who is the originator of the data? Yes, so that's something that we have spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out. Again, ideally, I would love to rely on the schema.org, like on the explicit semantic, like someone says, I'm same as that, and we know that that is the authority. And if that happens, we obviously rely on that. We use heuristics, we use a whole other set of features trying to figure out we're not perfect, if it's something pretty egregious and you own a data set, please, I don't know, like you can just do feedback. We always check the feedback in the tool. So the tool has the feedback, go to the page, click the feedback button. One of us will definitely look at it. Um, we need to, do, we're not doing a perfect job there, I know, but we do try. And that's something that at least like when, when there's multiple sources for the same data set, the primary one should appear first. And the metadata should come from that primary one. If it doesn't happen, please give us feedback. In general, please give us feedback. We do, uh, we read everything. Uh, I don't know, uh, so for people who ask the question, I don't want them to just be dropped somewhere in the ether. I don't know how you want to go about that or like people can contact me directly, but I guess that's one way I had my email on the slide. It's my last name at google.com, but uh, I don't know how you want. <laughs> The talk is also recorded. This includes the chat, and we could send you the chat, and then you can either contact the people or the contact. The people can also contact you directly. There's also a great question by a, a PhD student from Brazil, Gabriel. And maybe should we do one more, Natasha? Are you ready for one more? Sure. Well, I won't okay, do. Okay, thank you so much. 
Can we do the Q and A? I don't want to do the talk and kind of give people can watch the recording and then we can do the Q and A. Okay, so let's do it this way. Then, then okay, I would say let's end over here. Like we already that. minutes over time. No, I fully understand. Um, that was very, very, very exciting. And thanks, Natasha, for your patience. And I promise, once you start reading the chat, you will be busy for the entire evening. That was such a fantastic talk. And thank you so much to all of you attending and being so active in the chat. I hope you all enjoyed this. Let's give a big round of applause again to, to Natasha. And, and thank you so much. And see you hopefully in a future talk. Thank you.